Welcome back to the podcast, Plenary Session. Welcome back to the channel. This is Season 5, Episode 2 of Plenary Session Podcast. It's been running for five seasons now. I think it goes back to 2018. The video is a newer edition, but we've been doing it for a number of things, uh, for COVID policy, for oncology, clinical trials, you name it. And the videos have been popular because I can show some slides and walk you through some of the, the thinking. Today, I'm going to do some frequently asked questions. These are questions that have been piling up in my inbox. I'm going to run through them and hopefully give you a sense of what this show and channel is all about and what we hope to convey to you going forward. So number one, the first question, who is this podcast? Who is this channel for? What about other shows and other channels? Well, you know, when I titled Plenary Session a few years ago, it was an oncology podcast, but the subtitle was Medicine, Oncology, and Policy. And it always aimed to do that. Oncology, hematology, broadly. Medicine, broadly. And policy, quite broadly. And policy is very interesting to me. Policy is how we set the rules of the road. Policy is how we pay for things, how we decide to adopt things. And what was missing from that byline, which I really think is part of it, is practice. This is really a podcast and a channel about clinical practice to some degree. So I know there's a lot of competition out there now. There wasn't back then in 2018. We had the market cornered. But right now, there's a lot of competition. You can listen to all sorts of podcasts, and they can even focus on perhaps even a certain tumor type, perhaps even a certain type of policy, a certain type of oncology. I hope that this actually rises above the rest. I hope it's actually the, your go-to your go-to channel, your go-to podcast. That's what I aspire to deliver. We'll see if I can deliver that product for season five, but that's what we aspire to do. Why might uh, we offer something different? Um, one, we're going to cover things very broadly. We're going to cover every single hemonc, uh, tumor type, everything in classical hematology, everything in malignant, and everything in solid tumor. There's no type of hemonc that we won't go to. And we'll also go beyond medicine, go beyond hemonc if we need to into internal medicine and even into the broadest policy questions in biomedicine of the day reproducibility, research integrity, um, re, um, uh, data sharing, and even COVID-19. But I think COVID-19 is, people have come to their conclusions and we will only revisit it if we are actually gonna say something very different than what anyone else is saying and something very new. So I'm getting sick of repeating myself. My view and my policy vision, well, I think I'll, maybe I'll come to that in, in, a, in, a, in a future question. So this was the channel that broke apart, I think a number of really important clinical trials. Agile, Polo, Profound. It was the first channel to really take those studies and pff, shatter them. Adora, I think. Uh, you know, I heard a lot of people with criticism about all of these trials, but most of the time you can say, and if you can go back and you can play the reel, you heard it here first. You heard many of those points here first. Often you hear points that weren't made elsewhere on Dynamic. I think prior to our show on that, our video on that, no one had made those points. It's because there's a certain philosophy on this channel, so maybe I would just go ahead and address that. The philosophy on this channel is evidence-based medicine. Evidence-based medicine is something that began a long time ago. It even predates the term. The term was coined by Gordon Guyatt in the early 1990s in JAMA, but it goes back far longer than that to Alvin Feinstein and to, um, uh, and, uh, and to Sackett and others. And it really is about using the best available evidence to make clinical decision-making rather than eminence-based medicine, which is really what came before. But eminence-based medicine is alive and well, and it has never died. It's just, uh, you know, waxed and waned. And we have eminence-based medicine all the time, particularly in oncology, for things like MRD, which we'll tackle, I think, in a future video in this season. And many other topics, eminence-based medicine continues to show its face. But this channel is not about eminence-based medicine. It's not about telling you what to do based on anecdote. It's not about reasoning based on the lowest levels of evidence. It's about pushing for the highest levels of evidence. What might that look like? And if it doesn't exist, what is the best available evidence? But what kind of studies could we do to actually improve upon that evidence base? And that is the framework. I think the channel also is an empirical channel. It's based on how the world is, not how we want it to be. It's empiricism in its purest form. So when I take a question for which I don't have the perfect study, I apply empiricism. I apply pretest probability. I apply all the things I know about that question. I I also apply pathophysiology, but pathophysiology is often worse than pretest probability. So let me give you an example. When you think about cancer drug development, and we just published a paper, Allison Haslam uh, led that paper and was published uh, in the International Journal of Cancer, and it was about the probability of success of a phase one clinical trial that was presented either in abstract or in publication in 2015. She followed them out to 2022, and she knows how often a phase one substance made it to the market. So she has that probability. Now, if you come to me with a new cancer drug and you say, you know, how promising is this? And you show me all the preclinical science, the laboratory science, and this and that and the other. 
Somebody will say, they'll look at all that and make a judgment about the probability it will succeed. But what I would prefer to look at is to take compounds just like that and go back in history and, and say, what were the odds they worked? And put less stock in terms of the particular mechanism because many of the things that failed had equally elegant preclinical science and put more stock in, you know, what was the experience? What was the actual experience? And so that's empiricism. So my philosophy, of course, evidence-based medicine, also empiricism over merely rationale, reasoning, pathophysiologic rationale. These have historically been seductive, but often proven wrong. So all that said, I hope that this channel is a place where you hear something you've never heard elsewhere. And if anyone else is saying it, they probably got it here first. And that we are the ones that are going to unpack these clinical trials for you and these studies and this medical policy and these topical events in the clearest way possible with the most interesting evidence-based medicine spin. And that's why I'm going to hope that this actually earns its place as the first podcast you listen to in medicine, oncology, or policy. All right. That's my best answer to number one. And that's how I'm going to launch season five. Next question. All right, I just pulled these questions from all my inbox and I copied and pasted them. Haven't actually scripted too much of a reply, but I thought about it when I was driving today. What's your day-to-day -day life like? What's your balance? What's your clinical experience? What's your clinical expertise? Okay, fair question. What's my day-to-day -day like? Well, um, I think I'm an academic uh, hematologist oncologist and I have been on faculty at a university, currently the University of California, San Francisco, but a university for seven years. My first five years were in OHSU, I think many people know that, and the last two years plus have been at UCSF. What do I do? Well, I'm a practicing hematologist and oncologist. Uh, when I was in Oregon, I think I initially started as sort of a lymphoma person, but when you're a place like OHSU, kind of a small place, you very easily can find yourself doing other things. And so over the years, I ran lymphoma clinic for a year and a half, maybe I ran ahead in a cancer clinic. When a faculty member moved on, I took over a day of his lung clinic. And, uh, and a lot of things in between from colon cancer to et cetera. Now, another thing I should have mentioned is that uh, for a while there, they were short staffed in the community sites. So I went to the community sites associated with the university and actually practiced kind of broad hematology oncology. When I attended on service, because many people may know, but I'm a little bit close to Tom Delory, who's blood man on Twitter, uh, classic hematologist. And Tom got me to attend for at least a month on service on classical hematology. I also attended on leukemia service and autotransplant service. And so, and, and for a while on solid tumor service, and in a future video, I'll tell you why I tried to move away from that. But, you know, so, so I had sort of broad general oncology experience. My research was always health policy in those years. Currently, I attend broadly in hematology and oncology in the clinic. And then I do, you know, all these years between two and three months of the inpatient service and try to cover consult service. Uh, and I like to see the gamut, anything in classical hematology, anything in oncology. So that's why on this channel, when I take an oncology study, I'm going to take, you know, all of the studies in the New England Journal like I did for ASCO, and I'm going to dive into every single one from destiny breast to dynamic to uh, shine, you know, and I'm going to, you know, take every tumor type. It's not going to be limited to classical or solid tumor or heme malignancy. We will tackle anything. We're not afraid to tackle anything on this channel. And I think to some degree, it's because I've had a little bit of clinical experience in all of these things for all of these years. What's my day-to-day? -day? My day-to-day is also running a research team. It's VK Prasad Lab. You can go on the website, find it. You can find us on Twitter. We publish uh, a fair number of papers per year. Um, I think in the last year, we put out something like 50 publications. Many of them are commentaries, but many of them are original research articles, maybe about 50-50. Um, in prior years, it had been a little bit smaller. We had a good year. Why? Because uh, things are humming. Things are going well. Um, what is our focus. Again, it's clinical medicine. It's about the practice of oncology. Typically, at least 50% of our research, I think, or 50, 60% is oncology. How to interpret trials, how to think about trials, how to think about novel ways in which trials can be gamed, how to think about the cost of cancer drugs, approval, surrogacy, all those sorts of things. Maybe 20, 30, 40% is general medical topics. We've got some stuff coming in orthopedic surgery. We got a revise and resubmit there. We got some work coming in reproducibility. And so it's really a broad sort of policy-based research team. And that's my research focus. That takes up a fair bit of my time. And then the other hats I wear is I teach a class um, on publishing and presenting research. And I'm very interested in using not just peer-reviewed publications. I'm interested in using that too. So that's one thing I want to put a, uh, put a pin in. I'm not just interested in social media, YouTube, podcasts, depending on how you're listening to this and watching this. I'm interested in academic scholarship and peer-reviewed books and books in general. So I've written two books. Uh, those books are about general medical policy and oncology policy. I'm also interested in 
Substack and YouTube and podcasting. Why? Because I think that if you have sort of a view of the world and you want to share that with other people, you got to share it as as many platforms as you can. So that's that's my interest. So I would say what tumor types this person's asked uh, are you're interested in. I, I'm really interested in everything. Once upon a time, I thought I was going to do lymphoma. Uh, that uh, that uh, that didn't last long. I ended up doing a lot of things over the last seven years, and I still plan on doing that for years to come. What would you say my expertise is? It's actually in evidence-based medicine and policy, which is something that's beyond all of these things. I hope that on most oncology topics, we hold our own here. I mean, and we have to. Come on, let's be honest. On plenary session, we go hard on every single one of these. Not every single one, but on many papers, we go really hard. And if we weren't bringing very good, accurate content, we would get ripped up. But I see that there's a lot of protest for some of the points made on plenary session, but very rarely does it have to do with the substantive comments I'm making. I think that will come up in another topic. Okay, next question. How much research have you done? What topics? And I guess I would say you're going to have to go pull the list. Go to www.vinaykaprasad.com. Go to the papers tab. It will have, I think, most of the publications. It's I haven't updated it in a while. Uh, probably something like 350, 370 papers at this point, and they range from cost-effectiveness analysis to general internal medicine to pulmonary embolism to um, uh, TTP and keplicizumab to uh, sickle cell anemia. I think we did some papers on that to how we publish and promote residents to um, interview processes, some comments on that um, to uh, uh, Zetia to fish oil to uh, Paradigm HF and, and then also in oncology, anything you can think of from Olaparib to Quizar Artinib to censoring to surrogates to uh, you know the gamut. It's it's quite broad, broad interest there. Next question. I thought it was an interesting question. Are you trying to antagonize people? Are you trying to kiss up or kiss or, or suck up? I think they write. And I guess I would say that I'm not trying to do anything like that. I'm trying to say what I think is true. See, one of my biggest gripes about medicine in general is that I think many people do not try to say what they think is true. Our lives are short. And one of the only upsides of being a professor in medicine is that you get to pursue the truth as you see it. And so when I make these podcasts, I'm not trying to say Shine is bad because I dislike anybody who worked on Shine. In fact, I didn't even look at the author list. Uh, I, actually, very rarely do I actually look through the authors and see who is who before I come up with my view on the study. I am calling it as I see it. That's how I view it. Same thing on COVID policy. I'm not trying to antagonize anybody in my views. These are how I interpret things through my lens of evidence-based medicine and empiricism and history of medicine, which are the things that I've studied and think about. I am trying to tell you what I actually think. I'm not trying to kiss up to any groups. I don't care who they are. I don't care if I'm sometimes in agreement with people on who I on other issues with whom I disagree. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with if somebody who normally disagrees with me agrees with me on a few issues. I'm okay with that. I'm comfortable with that. I'm not trying to buddy up with any tribe or any group or hold on any group ideology. I'm trying to tell you what I think about any single issue, issue by issue, paper by paper, study by study, and policy by policy. And I will always deliver what I think to be true. Now, will I occasionally hold back? Sometimes I do hold back, um, but I will try to be as true to my own personality and, and how I like to tell things. And so I'm not trying to antagonize anyone. I'm trying to tell you what I think is true. I think that that is an element called authenticity, which is one of the things that will differentiate this podcast from other podcasts because we won't beat around the bush. We will tell you what we think is true. Uh, next question. What is your political affiliation? <laughs> okay. Well, tough question. I don't think it's as pertinent for oncology. Well, maybe it is, but I make no secret about it. I, I tend to be on, on, on the left side of the spectrum and I'm a progressive person. And, you know, you, you won't have to do much digging to find that that's the case. Read my two books. Uh, ending Medical Reversal and Malignant, they are about a well-functioning regulatory state that actually is accountable to people and not corporate interests. And that, those are the themes of that book. And so my political affiliation is on the left. I tend to agree with a lot of things on the left. On COVID, the left got lots of it wrong, totally wrong. And again, back to the last point, I am not trying to endear myself to anyone, nor am I trying to antagonize anyone. I am merely trying to tell you what I actually think. And so insofar as they did things I disagreed with, I told you repeatedly what I thought. And I brought guests on that I thought nicely fleshed out those issues. But that is not, in fact, uh, you know, the truth about my political affiliations. I tend to be on the left on most issues, particularly the regulatory state, which is the thing I study the most and I'm most interested in. Are you taking researchers? Are you taking researchers, VK Prasad Lab? Are we looking for researchers? Well, I would say at this point, um, the, the people who should reach out to VK Prasad Lab are people who have experience in hematology, oncology. If you're a fellow in Hemonc, I guess, reach out first and foremost. And, uh, and other groups of people, are, feel free to reach out as well. It's just that 
the projects come at different levels and right now we have a glut of projects for which we could benefit from somebody with that advanced knowledge which is a slightly different project than what I would give somebody who's say a pre-medical student or medical student you're too harsh on PFS and response rate sometimes they do matter they are measures of what matters to patients they are a measure of quality of life well here's you know, going back to my philosophy of oncology, which is laid out, I think, at length in the book Malignant, here's where I think you're just wrong. You're just wrong, actually. Um, feeling better does matter to people, and living longer matters to people. And you may think that PFS is the metric of that, but that's just because you're not really talking about what the construct of PFS is. PFS is not what you are experiencing in your clinic when the patient comes in in decompensated progression and you have to switch therapy or think about what to do next. Of course, that's one of the things that could be scored as a PFS event. But PFS is, of course, also 20% tumor growth from the nadir value or the smallest it ever was. And that, in clinical trials, is often the endpoint that they're measuring. They're doing the scans on people with a certain brisk speed, which I think Allison Haslam and I have published a paper on. And the moment you get to 122%, they're coding you as the event of interest. Why does that matter? The construct of PFS in clinical trials is arbitrary. People do not feel necessarily going from 119 to 122%. And most of the progression documented in these clinical studies is not, I feel terrible, my cancer has progressed as you may be thinking of it. It's actually these radiographic resist 1.1 criteria and the PFS by that. And the same is true for response. No one magically feels good at 31%, but terrible at 29%, which is the resist 1.1 re response rate threshold. And also you have to do a confirmatory scan if response rate is your primary endpoint of the study. Um, this is also outlined in Malignant, but it's important because no one disputes that cancer growing makes people feel bad and cancer shrinking makes people feel good. Those are loose associations, but that's not the question. The question is, as you're measuring the construct that you're measuring in the clinical trial, is that a suitable is that a suitable surrogate for living longer or living better? And the answer is, again, you turn to empiricism, which is one of my core philosophical principles. You don't just look at what makes sense, you look at what is the case. And if you look empirically at all of the studies that document changes in quality of life and changes in PFS, for instance, the COVAX study in JAMA Internal Medicine, which I believe Gordon Guyatt is also an author of. If you look at that study, and by the way, just remember, that was the guy who came up with EBM as the moniker. If you look at that study, you will find very, very poor correlation between feeling better and progression-free survival. Now, you need to be very careful, and this is something that, again, as I say, the philosophy of this channel is evidence-based medicine, not eminence-based medicine. Someone may have taught you that progression, pro not, avoiding progression is good because patients feel better. Well, you need to ask that person. What are you basing that on? Are you basing that on your clinical experience? Because of course that's true in your clinic. The person progresses, they often feel worse. But is that true in the context of clinical trials meant to help us tease out how we ought to treat aggregates of patients or groups of patients or have treatment strategies? Is that true? And the construct in clinic may not be the same as the construct in the trial. The trial is very regimented and very disciplined and follows very strict protocol specified thresholds for progression. Progression, free survival, a time to event composite endpoint. And so you need to understand trials and statistics to understand whether or not the evidence from the trial informs your clinical practice. And your clinical practice, if you have too much of an anchor on the clinical practice, you may misunderstand the trial, which is not exactly your clinical practice. And we have some ongoing work that will show you that even more. So my answer to your question is, are you too harsh on PFS and response rate is, if you're talking about your clinic and you're telling me your patient is progressing, then by all means, I'm gonna say, what are you treating with now? What have you treated with in the past? What are you going to treat with in the future? What are you thinking about doing? Um, what, what, is, uh, what is the risks and benefits of trying another treatment? You know, where are you with this person? What do they want? What are their goals? What are their wishes? But if you're going to talk to me about a randomized controlled trial where there's a, a flimsy PFS benefit like Bolero 1 and tons of differential informative censoring, and I think I talked about Bolero on a prior episode of this podcast, then I'm going to say, is that really a meaningful endpoint? And in fact, are you just documenting noise? And is that why in the subsequent Annals of, in of Oncology paper by Baselga and colleagues, there was no OS benefit? So yes, I'm harsh on PFS and response rate because again, this is a policy show and a policy show is really about practice. And I'm talking about clinical trials that are trying to change your practice because I care about your practice. I care about my practice because I'm going to see this too and have to make these decisions. But that's slightly different than the experience an individual person may have. And you need to always think about that. And I think that will tie into another question I saw, the difference between individual experience and aggregate experience and what we're actually talking about here. So I actually don't think I'm too harsh on PFS and response rate because again, I'm not basing it on eminence-based medicine ideas. I'm basing it on 
the crude empiricism of what studies have shown, including many studies that we've done, probably the best of which is by Alison Haslam in the European Journal of Cancer in 2017, I think, um, where we've looked at the correlation. And the correlation is things that improve PFS don't always improve OS. In fact, they seldom do. And the same is true for quality of life. And so that's why I'm harsh on it. Um, and if you disagree, I encourage you to do empirical work to document that these things are meaningful constructs. And if you really care about quality of life, you don't need to use a surrogate that's radiographic. You can measure that directly. And there are a number of health-related quality of life scores. There's a number of patient-reported outcomes that have some validity. And again, I want to put an asterisk there because on this podcast, I talk about when those actually start to lose validity. And we've done a lot of work in that space. You can prove it to me that they feel better. You don't have to prove it to me that their tumor is smaller on a CT scan when you measure it, you know, through the blur with your mouse, with your mouse and, you know, a jerky, a jerky wrist, you know? Okay. So, you know, that's a little different. Why do you focus so much on financial conflicts of interest? Money has to be exchanged to do research. It's just one of many biases that people have. It's a great question. And here's why I focus so much about it. When you counsel your patient in primary care clinic about carcinogens, why do you focus so much on tobacco smoking and don't focus enough about uh, refined sugars, Pepsi Cola, aspartame, I don't know, whatever other things you think cause cancer? And the answer is, you know, you see where I'm going. Smoking has been repeatedly shown as a carcinogen and it's powerful. It has an odds ratio of 20. It's a potent carcinogen, at least for lung cancer, and a carcinogen for other cancers, although more modest. And it has been shown over and over again in empirical studies. I don't think that's the same for aspartame or sugar, etc. You can argue with me. There are, the evidence is not as strong. Now, I'm not saying it's not strong enough to act upon these other things, but I'm saying smoking is particularly strong. Alcohol, for instance, is not as strong. It's, it's terrible for alcohol. We don't know. Do, I counsel, do we counsel our patients to drink one beer or zero beers if they're drinking three beers? I don't think so. Certainly not for a cancer standpoint. You may do that for a liver standpoint or something like that. But somebody drinks one beer a day, I don't think there's any doctor in America who's going to spend a whiff of breath trying to counsel them. But if somebody smokes half a pack a day, I think there are many who will try to counsel them to cease that. Now, that's a difference because the evidence base for tobacco smoke is very, very strong as a carcinogen. And the same is true for biases. Not all biases you think are a bias have robust empirical. Again, I'm an empiricist. Empirical data proving that they are linked to bad outcomes. Financial conflicts from the manufacturer to the doctor have been linked over and over and over and over again. And we've published many papers. A nice paper I think about is with Michael Hayes and colleagues in the Hastings Center report. Um, and it documents it documents the pervasive role of financial conflict of interest. It's a unique conflict, and that's why I focus so much on, on it. Now, the next point, money has to be exchanged to do research. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right that in the current environment, it would be impractical and infeasible to say that money can't be exchanged to do research. But there is a distinction in the open payments database between money paid to individual physicians that goes into their pocket their personal bank account or money paid to their institution to run the study at their university. And that's the difference between general payments and research payments. And I have never, ever, you can go back and play the tape. There must be hundreds of episodes and, you know, hundreds and hundreds, maybe a thousand hours of the show. I'm never critical of the research payments. I'm always critical of the personal payments. You do not have to take money and put it in your own pocket from Celgene to work with Celgene. You don't have to. There is somebody who's done that many times. I think Vincent Rajkumar has not taken money personally, but he's had research grants. You don't have to. They're not wedded together. We can stop the personal addiction, you know? And so similarly, I think that is a key distinction. So why do I focus most so much on financial conflicts? Because it has been proven over and over again to affect the results of research, including in work that we've done. Allison has a nice paper on cost-effectiveness analyses, and those that are funded by the industry are much more likely to conclude that costly toxic cancer drugs are cost effective surprise surprise um, than those funded by independent sources so it's just one of many biases okay sure i believe there are other biases i believe there's the bias to uh adhere to your past principles we all have that sort of consistency bias um there's a bias that if something's your baby your brainchild you're less likely to take a crap on it there's that bias um there are many other there's another bias which is that if somebody has a sensational finding the next most provocative paper would be to say that it's not true at all rather than to say that it's you know true but you know slightly less true or something like that there's there's this idea of novelty and a sexiness and that's a bias but what I wish to tell you is, if you want me to talk about these other biases that you believe are as salient as financial conflict of interest, then you need to convince me, an empiricist, that they are as salient by performing empirical studies documenting intellectual conflict of interest is a problem and all these other conflicts are a problem. You have never done that. No one has ever done that. It is not so easy to do. The more you think about it, how do you 
distinguish intellectual bias from a firmly held belief. President Obama passed Affordable Care Act that provided health care to all people. Did he have an intellectual bias that everyone needed health care? Did he just really believe that that's the right thing to do? How do you tease that apart? And then, of course, having had that belief, is oh, President Obama much more likely to see the upside of the ACA than the downsides of the ACA? I'm sure he is, you know? But how will you do that in a study? How will you do a study where you say doctors who have held X position are more likely to hold some position and distinguish that from you know, what you think is reasonable to what you think is just a bias. And I think that's very tricky. And there are no such study. I mean, there are very few good studies in that space. And if you think you have some really great studies, send them to me. I'd love to read them. Um, you know, I'm interested in that too. Okay, next question. Some of these trials are the only way poor nations get any drugs at all. Why do you hate on these trials that are run globally? And the answer is, of course, that... Um, we have to be honest about the regulatory system. The market share, the global market share in cancer drugs is about $150 billion. And where's the lion's share of that money spent more than 50%, perhaps 60% or 70% is spent in the United States. And then we have the Western European markets and we have a smaller market share in Africa, South America, Asia, much smaller market share. The companies are running a research agenda largely to sate the largest payer and that's the United States. And they also know that if they were to run all the studies in the United States, it wouldn't be so easy to always show the new drugs add to our existing standards of care because our standards of care are often pretty good because we have access to all the other good drugs. So they need to run these trials in a way that shows that they have a benefit, but it would be very difficult to run them in our nation, even though our nation is the nation they're seeking the, the bulk of the revenue from. And as much as you want to think that they're in the business of developing drugs to help all the people in the world, the truth is they're not. And if they were, they would price their drugs far lower so that they could be in reach of everyone. They don't. Her trastuzumab in a study um, from the Tata Memorial Group 10 years after the drug came out or maybe 15 years after the drug came out was only given to one in 200 women with HER2 positive breast cancer. That's unconscionable, okay? So they're not in the interest of making their drugs widely available. They're in the interest of capturing market share. I don't hate them for that because that's what you do if you are um, if you are indebted to your shareholders, but I recognize that that is the case. And as long as that's the case, they're going to run these. They're going to try to game the system. And now I would prefer they run trials that provide relevant information to the countries for which they seek the money, but they don't. They want to run global trials. And I don't think they're running global trials because they want to help people on the intervention and control arm. I also try to record everything in one take on this podcast. That's another novelty. We don't do any editing. This is usually uncut, but every so often there is some calamity for which I have to cut. I have to cut. Somebody pages me, phones me, something like that. Okay, back to what I was saying. Um, these nations, the only path for them to get the drug are, is participating in these trials. Well, I think first we have to acknowledge, as I point out, that the revenue is sought by, you know, in some nations, and the trials are really geared for regulatory approval in those nations. They're going to the other nations not because they care about the citizens of the other nations. If they did, they wouldn't price their drugs so damn high once they're approved. They're doing it because they can get away with poor control arm quality, poor post-protocol post protocol care and poor other types of ancillary services and ancillary care, which of course put a thumb on the scale favoring an experimental arm where you provide more services, you know, where you deliver more drugs or you allow people to get good backbone therapies. Um, including one great example in the book Malignant is how in Cleopatra, by adding pertuzumab to trastuzumab and ataxane, you actually give more trastuzumab and ataxane than the control arm because when you progress on the control arm, in many cases, you didn't get any more HER2-directed therapy. So actually some of the benefit of pertuzumab is actually due to giving proper amounts of trastuzumab, which you would have done had you done Cleopatra in the United States. Go read that part and you can think about it some more. But I think that argument is very, very strong. What's my point here? Now, now you're somebody who's running these trials globally and you think that something's better than nothing. But as I talked about in a prior video, that often what you're doing is you are selling your soul for a dollar bill. You don't know what you're giving up for something very small. To run the trial in, the com in your country and get a handful of people access to the experimental drug, what you do is you are actually changing the global market incentives. Now the company has less of an incentive ever to give you those novel drugs at a low price in the future. Because if they were to give you those novel drugs at a low price in the future, when they come along to do their next trial, and by the way, this is a repeat business, a repeat engagement business. When they come along to do their next trial, they will have to go up against a stronger competition. So they actually, you're incentivizing them by accepting these trials that they will crank up the price later so that you never get access to the drug in the back end. You, by accepting the trial with a drug that you could never afford because you know they're not gonna lower the price and having a straw man comparator, you're incentivizing them to keep your country 
dependent on straw man comparators so they can come back again and again and again. And I think that's not that's what you don't see. That this system is deeply exploitative of low and middle income countries for not just high income countries, for the United States market share and a handful of nations in Western Europe, a handful of nations, perhaps like Canada or, or Australia. But even then, if they lost all that market share, it wouldn't matter that much to them. The United States market share and the pricing here is so horrific. That's where they're getting all of their riches or most of their riches. So that's really what this game is about. And people throughout history who have participated in systems that had very, very bad outcomes and bad consequences don't see that they are participating in that bad system. They rationalize it to themselves. Of course, nobody views their own actions in a bad way. So, you know, why hate on them? I don't hate on any individual people. I hate on the system and I hate on the trial. And I do think that they are not doing themselves any favor by arguing against what I'm saying. They would, if you want to have a good argument for the nation, you should say, these drugs, there is a moral duty to make them available to the people of our nation. And we will not participate in a clinical trial unless you guarantee that if our trial is positive, that drug will be affordable in this nation in perpetuity. That's all you have to do. It's better for your own citizens. You're pushing for more. And the moment you do that, you will change the whole marketplace. They will actually no longer be incentivized to, um, to, 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 to run straw man compared to trials globally. They will be forced, I think, to give you the drug. Um, or they're going to try to run those trials in the United States. And then they're going to face, I think, a different challenge, which is going to be much harder for them to succeed. And so then they're going to have to face a real question of what they want to do with their market share. So it's going to lead to a lot of, I think, alternative ramifications, which I talk about in the book Malignant in the uh, epilogue. Okay, next point. You can't have an RCT for everything. Yes, this is true. You know, I never disputed this. You can't have an RCT for everything. You know, I don't have an RCT for uh, should I brush my teeth in the morning? Should I drink a cup of coffee? What should I pack for lunch? Uh, you know, should I go running today? Should I go biking? I don't have an RCT for probably most of the decisions I make. Should I change jobs? Should I write that paper? Should I do this? Should I do that? I don't have RCTs for any of these. I don't suffer from any paralysis in decision making at all, but I don't have RCTs for most decisions I probably make in my life. You don't have to have an RCT for everything. But you do have to have an RCT, at least one to show the fundamental efficacy of medical products. Why? Because many medical products we think work don't work. So we want to separate the wheat from the chaff and we're all paying for it. And so I have never said you need to have an RCT for uh, carbotaxol for every single type of situation you would ever want to give carbotaxol. But you do need an RCT of carbotaxol at some point to know it's better than just giving Taxol or just giving Carbo or not giving either one drug at all, to have some idea that it has some efficacy, to know at some point if something actually works. So when you come to COVID-19 policy, you don't need to have a randomized trial of every single little thing you could do with a mask, but it would be nice to have one cluster randomized trial in a, in a high income nation that actually shows it actually did something. It would be nice to have a fundamental proof of concept randomized trial for many of these decisions. We know uncontrolled studies in medicine are notoriously upwardly biased. We know historical control studies can be misleading. We know these things we've learned time and time again. And my books are really careful catalogs of the errors we've made because I'm a believer that he who forgets history is condemned to repeat it, the George Santayana quote. So again, I'm an evidence-based medicine person. EBM people have never said you need a randomized trial for every unique situation. And doctors will always tailor their therapies for the unique situation in front of them. No one has ever said otherwise. But the question is, do you need a randomized trial at some point measuring an endpoint that people actually care about when you debut novel, costly, toxic products in a marketplace where there may be an upper bound ceiling on spending of like $20 billion or that's where you're headed for? Do you need an RCT then when you're going to spend $20 billion over the next decade? And the answer is yes, of course you do. Of course you need to show fundamental efficacy when you're going to spend $20 billion of taxpayer money on this. And if you're not proving that it works, then you might just be parasitizing people's salaries to contribute to the, the, the industrial state of healthcare, the medical industrial complex. And I would have a big problem with that. That's really a form of, again, as I said, my politics, I'm a progressive. That's a form of regressive taxation. That's a form of modern day feudalism to have healthcare products that don't add any value that siphon money from poor people to rich people. It's not delivering a healthcare product. It's a financial product that's regressive. It's sort of a feudalistic system. And so again, that fits my politics. That fits my philosophy. Why can't I just follow the guidelines? 
well, you know, somebody asked me, you know, they said, I really like to follow those guidelines. I said, I like to follow those guidelines too, except when I disagree. You know, the thing about guidelines is they are for the guidance of a wise people and the obedience of fools. And so you don't want to um, follow the guidelines slavishly. Um, you, you need to think for yourself. Guidelines can be wrong. They can be conflicted. Um, people have shown that 85% of the writers for the NCCN guidelines, which, by the way, are compendia that oblige Medicare to pay for drugs, we talked about that on this podcast. 85% are receiving personal payments. Again, not research payments, general payments from the biopharmaceutical industry. And so those guidelines tend to be a kitchen sink. You could do this or this or this or this or this. And Medicare should pay for all these things. They are being done to exploit the system. I mean, they are being done to bring revenue to pharmaceutical companies. And they may not always make people better off. There may be so many choices. You actually can choose the bad option. And you might be incentivized or detailed to choose the bad option. And so, yes, Guidelines are a great place to learn oncology. It's a great starting point, but it's not a finish line. And if your career, if you, if the, if the extent of your clinical practice is you only get really good at knowing what the guidelines say, then I, you know, I think you could do better. And if you, and, and to be honest, you, I know you think you can do better because that's why you're listening to this. If you really thought the guidelines were sufficient, you would not be listening to this. You're listening to this show because you think you can do better than the guidelines. And so do I. I know I can do a lot better. And our research agenda and the show and the other things I do are geared with that in mind. The guidelines can often be wrong. They can also be right. And I don't quibble with them when they're right. That's like I, that's why I tell this person, I love to follow the guidelines, except when I disagree. Surrogates, this person, somebody writes, surrogates are, are uh, you know, you're too harsh on surrogates because they do speed drugs to market. And here is, again, I come back to my core philosophy. I am an empiricist. I'm not an eminence-based medicine person. When I trained in oncology, everybody of eminence, nearly everybody, told me that that was the case. Surrogates speed drugs to market. They speed drugs to market. But I'm an empiricist, so I said, prove it to me. Prove it to me that it speeds drugs to market. And so we launched, Emerson Chen and I, um, a study where we tried to estimate the time savings reduction. We first saw that most surrogates are used in the latter lines of therapy. When somebody's failed, or the drugs have failed that person, many lines of prior therapy, then they're using a surrogate to approve the drug as a salvage drug. But my first question was that in those dire circumstances, overall survival, could not possibly take that long. It can't possibly take that long for relapse refractory myeloma or pentarefractory myeloma or relapse refractory leukemia or relapse pancreas cancer. It can't possibly take that long. You can measure OS directly. Why do you need a surrogate? And in fact, what we find is that in a meta-regression analysis published in JAMA Internal Medicine, that surrogates do not save time in the latter lines. They just don't save any time at all. They do save some time in the front lines, as you might expect, but they come with the price of uncertainty. And the time they save, if you look across the whole system, is roughly... 11% of the time, or 11 months, taking drug development from 8.3 years to 7.2 years. That's something. But it's not taking it from 20 years to, to 10 years. And many of the claims that are made are false. We can't do a study that shows OS benefit in frontline myeloma. People live 10 years. I'm sorry, you can. You could target high-risk individuals. You should also know that Velcade showed an OS benefit in 16 months. You don't have to wait for the median to re be reached to see an OS benefit in Jupiter, the trial of resuvastatin, they found an OS benefit with 2.3 years. You don't have to wait that long. You know, I'm not saying I agree with somebody wrote that, you know, there's some problems with Jupiter. I know there are problems with Jupiter, okay? I'm using Jupiter as a point, and the point is about time, okay? I know there are problems with Jupiter. Okay, my point here. Surrogates do not take that long. I am not an eminence-based medicine person. I didn't believe what people told me merely because they were telling me I did my own study. And ours is the only study that has documented this, and ours is the right, I mean, not the right, but it's the best study to time. Maybe... I can already think of ways I could do it better, but not ways I could do it better with data available to me. So once I have more data, which is another theme that you talk about on this podcast, data sharing, then I'll do it even better. But right now, that's the best way we can do it. And I think it's pretty close to the truth. I mean, I think it's intuitive that for um, polo trial, why the hell are you measuring PFS and pancreas cancer? The median OS was already resulted at the time of the initial report, 18.3 months. And that, by the way, in the final report, is not improved. So why the hell do we talk about PFS? in that terrible trial where you halt in a chemo that's working, by the way. And I've talked about polo many times and wrote an article about it in uh, the journal Cancer with Go Nishikawa. I read the trial and I spoke to the PI. Why do I need to read your take? Okay, that's, I was like, somebody said, I read the trial, I spoke to the PI. I was like, I don't know, because my take is often different than the PI. And sometimes I, you know, I might know more, more than the PI, maybe not about the details of the protocol. 
and maybe not as much about all the other sort of quasi-experimental studies going on in that tumor type because that's just too much to keep up with, and I know they keep up with that better, but I might know more about them than in statistics, reasoning, uh, problem solving, uh, uh, in, in classic pitfalls of medicine, in history of medicine, in classic reversals in oncology, because those are the domains I study, and that's a different type of knowledge, and that knowledge can sometimes lead me to a different take. And I think the clearest example is you can go back and watch the videos of Dynamic. My take on Dynamic is very different than what people were saying. But after they listened to my take, I think a lot of people acquiesced. And they said, that's probably right. And the other thing about PIs is sometimes they don't know much. There was, of course, that famous PI on a podcast who didn't know, didn't know what stages of tumor were in, the tum were in the trial that they themselves were PI to. They didn't know the stage. They didn't know early stage patients were included. That speaks to, I think, the fact that some PIs are just phoning it in. They're just saying, I agree with the manuscript the medical writer drafts. I don't phone it in. You know, I, uh, 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 I, I walk on the tightrope on this thing because it takes some of these trials on you walk on a tightrope. So I have to know what I'm saying is right. So I have to do a lot of digging. So why do I need to read your take? I don't know. I hope to persuade you that you do. In fact, if you've listened this far in the video, I suspect you think you do need to hear my take. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. You would have already attritioned. So, oh, and then the last thing I'll talk about. Uh, I didn't like what you said that one time. You said that trainees haven't yet practiced medicine, and I disagree because I'm a trainee and I'm doing a lot of important work. And I guess I want to say, let me be clear about what I actually said. Because, and you should also try to be clear. When you, when you, when you hear someone said something you want to know and you, and you disagree with them, the first thing I do is I try to verify what did they actually say. I especially try to do that if I find myself feeling an element of anger with what they were saying. I really want to know what they actually said. But to be honest, there are very few things that I find myself angry with what people say. I just, I just don't get angry by what things people say. I mean, I get angry more by what they do, you know, uh, and, uh, and maybe the spin of their, of their publications, but I don't get really sort of that moral outrage component. But anyway, what I said was this a long time ago in some random interview. It was really about the full depth of practicing medicine. And I made the case, and I still believe this, that the full depth of practicing medicine is when you really feel that not only that you were accountable, but there was no one else who was accountable. There's no one else you can share the accountability with. And my point is that as great, I mean, and of course, there, there are fellows, I know one, I was just thinking of vividly, this fellow is so good, I almost never can tell him something he doesn't know. It kills me. I have really, I, you know, I like to be able to tell him something once a day that he doesn't know, so I feel like I've earned my pay. But this guy is so good, I cannot tell him anything. And I've worked with him so many weeks. And then, you know, I worked with him so many weeks over the years. I'm like, this guy, I can't tell him anything. And then once in my whole time working with him, I found one case where I had said something that I turned out to be right and he turned out to be slightly wrong. And boy, I, you know, I really told it to him, Dad, because just because I, had, I want to have something to teach this guy. Okay, what does that mean? Trainees can be really good. I'm sure this guy is better than maybe even many, many practicing doctors. This person is superb. It's a trainee, but that's different than what I think. What I was, what what I think, what I was getting at, and what I was talking about, which is which is fully covered in the full video, which is the deep practice of medicine, which is also that accountability to know that there was something that happened that didn't go always the way you wanted, and that there's no one else culpable but you. You're culpable, and that only happens when you're the attending. And you don't even feel it, I think, full grasp of it until you're several years into being an attending. The first two years of an attending life is a blur because even though you know the answer, often you're asking someone else to double check a lot of things. But in year three and year four and year five, and year six and year seven, I think it starts to really be different. And you start to have more confidence to disagree with somebody who you may have once thought of as your mentor or your teacher. And so what I mean by my statement is that the deep practice of medicine only comes from knowing that the buck didn't stop with anyone else. And I know some people say that like, well, you can be a trainee at a county hospital, but you know, I mean, you were always having some supervision. There's always someone else who's gonna be uh, named in the litigation. There's always somebody else who should have been, maybe if they, they were not doing it um, as much as they should have, but they should have been accountable for all those decisions. And, 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 and again, you, and even if they didn't talk to you about that decision and you ended up making the decision, the burden is still not on you because you could say they were supposed to be accountable and they didn't you know, show up on time, they didn't come to rounds, they didn't call me and they didn't talk to me and they left me to my own. And that is still different than I think the deep practice of medicine. So of course, trainees know a lot. Some are excellent, better than many practicing doctors, but the deep, real agony and ecstasy of being a doctor only comes several years in. And I think this also fits with like, you know, I, I disagree that just doing the MD degree does not a doctor make, and I do think residency and fellowship are the minimum of what anyone needs before they should be able to say they're a doctor, because I think doing an MD without a residency or fellowship is not that useful. It's really like, I mean, I don't know, you could just watch a few, you could watch like 
in fact, in fact, what is it? Doing an MD without doing a residency and fellowship, that's like the equivalent of shadowing a bunch and watching like a bunch of YouTube videos. It's not the deep practice. It's not the accountability part of it. And I think that only comes with attending life. And so, you know, I guess I still, I still tend to believe that that's the case. And also, I also don't understand why you'd actually get up upset about it. I mean, really, because you know, if you disagree and you're like, okay, well, if you disagree, then see what it's like when you're in attending for five years and then call me. If you're in attending five years into practice and you call me and you say, you know what, those five years of practice as an attending, um, that, you know, was exactly the same as the experience I had as a fellow. If you feel that way strongly, you can call me and tell me that, then maybe I'll revise my thinking. But I strongly think that nobody will be calling me with that because I think everyone who's practiced for five years will say that was a very different experience than the training. And even though I would, they're superb trainees, you really, quote, quote, unquote, don't know what it's like to have that deep practice of medicine until you spend a few years on practice. Okay, those were the questions. Covered fast and furious. Only one, only one interruption. Those were the questions. This is Plenary Session Season 5. This is the channel. I'm going to talk about all sorts of, I think, topical healthcare topics. I have this idea, and it's going to be super interesting, um, and it's going to it's gonna try to bridge uh, a lot of my interests in Supreme Court and all the healthcare policy decisions being made. I also, I'm going to hit so many oncology papers that I have had stacking up that I think are terrific. And again, I think, I hope this is the podcast, your go-to podcast, anything medicine, oncology, policy. I know you have options, but I hope this is one where we say something different. And again, I hope I've outlined at least sort of the broad contours of my philosophy of medicine, which informs my research, which informs this podcast, which informs my view of the world. And again, like I said, it's not done to antagonize and it's not done to ingratiate. It is done. I'm telling you what I think. I will always tell you what I think. And if I really don't want to tell you what I think, I won't cover it in an episode, okay? But I will. if I'm covering it, I'm going to tell you what I think. And that's what you're going to get. And I'm not thinking it for any other goal than trying to adhere to what I think is most important, my philosophy of medicine, which has been outlined in two books and many articles and will be outlined in many more things to come if, because I'm, I'm busy at work on some stuff. So if you like this video, you know what to do. Like, subscribe, comment, leave a message below. If you're listening on the audio feed, I guess, uh, was there anything special in this video? No. You just saw my face. There's no slides. But sometimes when I talk about trials, and I'll warn you on the audio feed, I'll warn you on the audio feed that you want to watch the video. And when I warn you, heed my warning. Heed my warning because the video will have some great slides. But this time, not so much. So until next time.